I'm about as real as they come. All my beats tailored by Drew. Drew. House Digital. Maserati, Rick, and Detroit. Deep. Convertible bird in Miami. Yo. Graduated summa cum laude. Yo. Strip club made a tsunami. Black. Carlton Hines with the ball game. Wish. Grateful Edmonds with the snowflakes. No. Craig Pettis in the M Town. Yeah. Sal Magluta with the boat game. <laughs> Falcone with the cocaine. Uh. Like Freeway Ricky with the plug game. Uh. Like Monster Cody in South Central. Uh. Larry Davis from Close uh. Range. The feds was coming out the door and they grabbed me right then and there. Took me to another side door, right out the back behind the building, into a car and shot me down there on Van Bruin to the federal yeah, court. You building. said that your dad was caught with like eight million dollars, six bricks? Yeah. That's why I wanted to be just like him. Said eight million shit. <laughs> So, so your dad had eight million in the stash when he got busted. Eight million. I wonder why the fuck he had. Why he had it in that spot? Wow. In culture, then in that area was basically what my high school was was majority BDs. What I was, it was uh, the majority, ninety nine point nine percent of GDs. And on the outskirts, we had stones and vice lords on the outskirts. So we just kind of circled around, but mainly where I hung up, it was just mainly GDs. Oh, <laughs> and that high school, you know, I'm doing my little thing, Kurt. I'm doing my little personal. Uh, we ain't really organized. We just running in the neighborhood, right? So now the neighborhood, now they calling for the neighborhood to be organized now. So they sent a guy up to Robeson, up to the high school. And they told that guy to go up to the high school and find out who's up there. This is the head GDs, right? At the time, I don't know nothing about them because we ain't really, we just doing our little thing, doing it without no type of authority or even recognizing authority. But authority was around and they sent the guy up there and he called all the guys out to the back of the school and everybody was running through the school talking about, man, back then it was generals and dons, you know. So they was talking about Don Pancho is back there. And he want everybody, every GD and BD, whatever you is, he wants you in the back of the school. And we went in the back of the school. And he said, hey, man, I'm around here and I want to know from around here. We want to organize this area here and we want to know who is the most influential guy amongst y'all. And they all said, Dirk and Bible. And then Bible said, well, I don't have much influence as you think. And Dirk got all the man. So he's, he yielded to me. And that's how it started. 1991 is on its way to being the second deadliest year in Chicago, the bloodiest part of the city, Englewood. Another murder scene in Chicago. A woman and a 12-year-old boy shot to death. Police have charged the boy's stepfather. The killings are among 906 that have now been recorded in the city. All right, y'all ready for a little history lesson? In 2012, Chicago was labeled the nation's murder capital by the FBI, surpassing New York City, which recorded 419 homicides, and Los Angeles, which had about 299, according to FBI data. Right and around this time, it would lead to the term Chirac being coined to depict the city's violent reputation, liken it to the turmoil in Iraq. Despite those alarming statistics, the violence in 2012 did not match the deadly toll in the early 1990s. In 1990, Chicago recorded a staggering 849 homicides, with 602 of those homicides being by gunfire which was the highest percentage ever recorded at that time, with it only getting worse the next couple years over. The violence in the 1990s was fueled by factors like the emergence of crack cocaine and territorial conflicts amongst gangs. And while a gang truce in 1992 seemed effective in certain areas, such as the notorious Cabrini Green housing projects, it failed to prevent violence in neighborhoods like Englewood on the south side despite the two areas being only about 11 miles away from each other. 
Now, the truce was sparked after the tragic death of seven-year-old Dontrell Davis. And despite the efforts to curb the violence, including isolating gang leaders and shifting drug markets, homicide rates stubbornly remain high, particularly in Englewood. I know this boy who got shot, who went to Jenna, two more boys, I think. Anthony Felton and Rosa Roosevelt. I don't know his last name, but Laquita Elwes got shot too. It's, it's, it's like, you gotta be careful to walk to school and can pretty green. Last fall, Senkwe lost another classmate to a sniper's bullet. Seven-year-old Don Trail Davis was shot in the head as he walked hand in hand with his mother across the parking lot from his building to Jenner School. Senkwe's mother and other mothers at Cabrini now shudder when they send their children off to school. Yeah, I pray every morning, you know, before they get ready to go to school, that we get on our knees and we pray. Don Trell was the third Jenner grade school student killed by gunfire this year. His death quickly became a symbol of the escalating urban violence that cities seem to be unable to control. Chicago Mayor Richard Daly. What we see is, unfortunately, the wanton violence, the total disregard of human life by gang and drug dealers. And it's almost declaring a war. That's what we are, really. They're declaring a war against the gang dealers and, and drug dealers and gang bangers in our city and our nation. We have to. We have a war here. And we have to go after them the same way they go after innocent people. 1991 is on its way to being the second deadliest year in Chicago. The bloodiest part of the city, Englewood. 92 murders recorded here through the end of November. This year also marked the killing of Jimmy Haynes, the first CHA police officer to die in the line of duty. The gang influence is strong. Police say 115 gang-related murders were recorded through December 1st. 7th Ward Alderman William Beavers, chairman of the City Council's Police and Fire Committee, says the federal government has driven the family unit to break down, leading kids to join gangs. There's no men in the family. Uh, the churches have failed. A number of programs have been cut out geared to the youth. Beavers says the police and city are doing all they can. The key to stopping the killings, he says, is to get everyone a job. O'Malley sees a greater need to put repeat offenders away longer. In some respects, I, I am uh, saying that I would uh, argue in many cases the judges have to be uh, far more severe. But O'Malley points out the judges must stay within sentencing guidelines, some of which he feels are not tough enough. And he agrees with Alderman Beavers that a strong economy would be a strong knockout punch to the rising murder rate. Gina Tedesco, Channel 5 News. More about young people and violence. What was supposed to be a lasting truce between rival Chicago gangs is a shambles tonight. Officials there have asked the federal government to step in, while police take unusual steps to stop the violence. Here's NBC's Dawn Fratangelo. It's after midnight on Chicago's South Shore, and police are enforcing a curfew for minors. Everybody's a juvenile. Take one step back toward me again. It may be what keeps these kids alive or out of gangs. It also holds their parents accountable. Ms. Lizzie yes. Banks? Yes. They were parked for curfew earlier this month, so now we are here to write you a ticket. We have to go to court. Curfew enforcement, which began last month, is just one new weapon being used in a violent Chicago gang war. The motive? Drug turf. Authorities were able to intercept more than a ton of cocaine recently, but stopping gang gunfire has been harder. There have been more than 500 homicides so far in Chicago this year, far exceeding the number last year at this time. Many of the victims have been unsuspecting youngsters. A three-year-old shot to death while sitting in a car. Two young girls seriously wounded. This 15-year-old shot in the foot believes he was mistaken for a gang member. And a boy just started shooting over me. And I'm lucky today that I'm alive. That's why these thugs are able to do what they do, because the society is living in fear. But we have to stand up to them. Counselor Jeffrey Haynes is trying to do that through a pilot program that lures gang members away from drugs and violence. They live together in this complex and hold legitimate jobs. I've seen a lot of people get hurt, innocent people. Chicago police are pulling out all the stops, holding roll calls in the middle of gang-infested areas, even asking the FBI and the ATF for help. It's bad, you know, but uh, I think we're going to put a lid on it. 
It's an unprecedented show of force that will try to rival a heavy gang arsenal. Truce organizer and longtime activist Marion Stamps admits that the truce has broken down in other parts of the city. But she says the gang leaders on the north side can better control their members. You know, the leadership is more concerned about how much money they can make off of drugs as opposed to how much money they can bring into the, to their communities to make sure that brothers and sisters get jobs, then, then they're going to have wars like the kind they have in Robert Taylor. You know, the question of turf, the question of drugs, you know, and um, that's not what happened here. I think the reason that, um, that the peace exists is, is primarily what that brother said, the leadership. The leadership is in control. The violence in the 90s it is, is um, we here on cred and I'm told only a handful of people this. The violence in the 90s between the BDs and the GDs actually started with us in Inglewood. At the time I got my rank, also the Freemans got their rank. We got our rank at the same time. Shorty Freeman gave his nephew's rank and uh, they gave me rank. We rolled up together, me and the Freemans, but at this time right here, we had to split the land because we both on two separate things. So, splitting the land up like that, they was asking for more than what they was um, entitled to. And being, that, and being that way, Kurt, only draws out a line that you can't cross now. I need this territory, they need that territory. And they won't yield to the territory, and they figured they should have more. And this is what started the war over territory. Who should have what? And that was the that was the bloodbath of the 90s that we're speaking about right now. All started over territory. Dante Big Dirk Banks Sr. would emerge as a central figure and a perceived ringleader in a notorious drug organization that operated in Chicago from 1991 through 1993. According to the government, Big Dirk, along with his co-defendants, Robert Shipp, Mario Dunlap, and a guy by the name of Alton Mills, the government will point out that the transactions were often multi-kilogram deals that involved substantial amounts of cash, and they were conducted directly between Big Dirk and his suppliers, with some of the deliveries even being made to his residence. Now, one of those significant transactions detailed in the indictment occurred in the spring of 1993, when three kilograms of cocaine were sold through a female by the name of Tasha Woods, who was actually the cousin of Big Dirk. In an interview, he would speak on how his introduction to the game came through a female cousin of his, though he wouldn't mention the name of that female cousin. Now, I'm not quite sure if they're the same person, but this specific cousin would testify for the government under the grant of immunity. The government would add that in the act of trying to add layers or separate themselves, that one of the co-conspirators, Alton Mills, would begin handling and exchanging the cocaine and cash with the suppliers on behalf of Big Dirk, starting in and around March of 1993. By the time the indictment would come down, all four defendants, including Ship, Dunlap, Mills, and Big Dirk, would face a range of charges that included conspiracy, possession with the intent to distribute cocaine, and the use of telephones to facilitate narcotic offenses. But despite their attempts to distance themselves from the conspiracy, suppliers would testify against them in pursuing of plea deals and they would shed light on the inner workings of the organization and the elaborate drug distribution network. And those stature of those charges would lead to a high profile trial in which they would try to focus on Big Dirk as the ringleader. And in July of 1994, a Chicago media outlet would point out that U.S. District Judge Marvin Aspen would reluctantly impose life sentences on Big Dirk and the other three of his co-defendants due to the amount of crack that was distributed by the organization. With his sentence underscoring the strict guidelines mandated by those recent crack laws that had been passed the few years prior. Thought left to die away, Big Dirk would get a breath of fresh air in 2018 after one of his appeals would come through and after serving almost a quarter century in prison, he would be released right in and around 2018. 
And if you ever wondered about him or wonder how much of a stand-up guy he is, in one of his interviews after being released, he would speak on being taken down to the federal building and that feds offering him immunity to pretty much give them anything on Larry Hoover. Now, the old man who had been incarcerated for some time for a body was probably not the easiest person to snitch on, but the government had him down the rights already. So with him even not cooperating, they probably would have had enough to convict Larry Hoover as much as they wanted to. And he still stayed down. And it's that decision that he would make three decades ago that would give his son the ability and even more credibility to call himself the voice of the streets. Now, y'all make sure y'all hit the red bell and subscribe button right under this video so y'all know when this real trail spill shit is dropping. Y'all get in the comment box below. Y'all let me know what cities we need to go to, what stories we need to tell, what we missed, what we got wrong. Y'all go ahead and tap in with me directly on IG, Twitter, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. And until the next play, y'all know how we rocking. Shades popular. Salute the almighty mob.